What's going on guys, this is Rob, and if you're enjoying the content here on my channel, then make sure you hit the like button, and make sure you hit subscribe so you can help decide what direction the content on my channel goes in, in the foreseeable future. Okay, so it's been a little while since we've done a character explanation. We did the Vulture, but the Vulture was really more of like, can I still do these? And I think we can. <laughs> I think I'm still the comic book explanation guy on YouTube, or at least a character explanation guy on YouTube. Not to toot my own horn, but I feel like my character explanation videos were pretty darn good, you know, back when I was doing them consistently. And getting back into original content, I want to come jump back into that again. But in this video, we're going to be talking about the Incredible Hulk. Now, some of you guys might be scratching your head, <laughs> considering all the Hulk videos that I've done you're just kind of like you've never done an incredible hulk explained i did back when i first started but the issue was that i was still fleshing out character explanations and so that video was something like eight minutes long or something along those lines it wasn't you know it wasn't really on par with my traditional character explanation videos and so in this one we're really going to kind of beef that up one of the other things that i want to talk about here is what's going on with marvel legacy now those of you guys who have looked up the different solicitations which is to say marvel basically teasing what comics are coming out with marvel legacy you'll notice the incredible hulk is basically kicking off with issue number 709. Now, the reason why Marvel's doing that is because of the fact that while the Incredible Hulk title, the name has changed over the years, it's been Indestructible Hulk, simply just called Hulk, it's been the Incredible Hulk. The fact remains that over the course of Marvel's entire publication history, regardless of what the title was called, there have been 708 comics that have been dedicated to a solo series for the Incredible Hulk. And so what Marvel's doing is basically coming back and saying, this is basically the 709th comic of the Incredible Hulk that has in some form or fashion been a solo series. And so the Incredible Hulk first appeared in Marvel Comics in May of 1962 uh, with Incredible Hulk issue number one, and he was created by Stan Lee and Jack Kirby, and that was par for the course back then. Remember, back in the 1960s when Marvel was really first beginning to gain steam, it was really just an attempt to crank out as many characters as humanly possible. I mean, the introduction of Barry Allen and DC Comics had basically set in motion the Silver Age, so to speak, or the second renaissance of comic books. And so now comic book characters were just as popular as they had ever been. But the Incredible Hulk was not just an arbitrary creation by Stan Lee and Jack Kirby. Instead, he really had his roots in Ben Grimm, the Thing from the Fantastic Four. And the reason for that was because of the fact that the Fantastic Four were the first family of Marvel. If Marvel wanted to introduce a character or team in the uh, Marvel Universe or bolster an existing character or team's popularity, they featured them in the Fantastic Four. And we'll actually find out they did that with the Incredible Hulk here in a little bit. But initially, the Incredible Hulk was just designed to be Stan Lee's attempt to kind of take this Frankenstein slash Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde dichotomy and then merge it into a singular being. But the whole the whole basis behind this was that with Ben Grimm, it was established that there was a measure of popularity when it came to just really strong powerhouse characters. I mean, Thor was the exact same way when he came later on down the line. It was basically the idea that some fans just want to see a character just wreck stuff. But Stan Lee was not without some kind of poetry when it came to the different characters that he made. And so again, kind of reminiscing in this whole Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde thing, the Incredible Hulk was designed to be the sort of epitome of human nature, whereas Bruce Banner was the epitome of just like rational thought rational thinking. Now, what the two represent have just kind of changed, waxed and waned over the years, and the metaphors are evenly exchanged, but the fact remains that it's basically this idea that the Incredible Hulk represents the darker side of things, this unbridled rage, unbridled hatred, so on and so forth. And the cool thing is that there'll actually be a guy named Bill Mantlo here in a little while that we'll talk about who will sort of move this into a whole new echelon. But Stan Lee's idea with regards to the Incredible Hulk was to originally make him gray. And that's why if you look at the original Incredible Hulk 1 through 6 series, he is a gray character. And the goal of Stan Lee was to basically move away from anything that had to do with any sort of cultural appropriation, which is to say he didn't want the Incredible Hulk to basically be a representation of any one particular race. Now, back then, it was really just the idea of, you know, playing it pretty even keel, playing it pretty, you know, pretty reasonable with a character's development. In this day and age, it would really be more of people looking at that and saying, well, yeah, I mean, he doesn't want to upset anybody or something along those lines. But regardless of the motivation behind it, the Incredible Hulk actually was not very popular when he first showed up. And the reason for that was because of the fact that much like, you know, the X-Men when they first cropped up on on the scene, Marvel already had Ben Grimm. They already had The Thing, and he was on a team with the Fantastic Four. Why read a story about the Incredible Hulk when you can read a story about The Thing? And so the result was that after about six issues or so, uh, Marvel basically canceled the Incredible Hulk story. But the goal was that Stan Lee and Jack Kirby kind of looked at what was happening and said, well, maybe we just kind of like leapt before we looked. Maybe we just kind of jumped too far too fast. And so the idea was to basically wrap the Incredible Hulk back in to the Fantastic Four and various other anthology series before they actually went through and started jumping in and giving him his own solo story. 
And so what had happened was that in March of 1963, with the cancellation of the series and issue number six, uh, in turn, Steve Ditko, uh, a handful of others, really just sort of looked at the idea of the Incredible Hulk and rolled him over into the Fantastic Four issue number 12. And so what ended up happening is following this and the advent of the Avengers, the Incredible Hulk was rolled over as the antagonist of the Avengers themselves. And that's really one of the interesting things about the story is because one of the biggest misconceptions people have is that like Captain America, for example, started the Avengers. It was actually Hank Pym and uh, Janet Van Dyne who brought the Avengers together originally. And it was simply the idea that Loki had popped up on the scene and Loki had decided to use the Hulk to his own ends in order to instigate a conflict. Uh, it ended up seeing the, you know, the unification of uh, really the most powerful non-mutant superheroes at the time, uh, which resulted in the formation of the Avengers team. And so following this, the actual concept of Bruce Banner, you know, being given his name, Robert Bruce Banner, came in Amazing Spider-Man issue number 14 in 1964. And for the most part, that was really what his stories were. His story was, you know, it was really just kind of him being rolled over into Tales of Astonish, an anthology series, you know, that really just kind of picked up with him being rolled in in issue number 60. And it was just really just, you know, the Incredible Hulk alongside several other characters that were being featured at the time. And it actually turned out to be a pretty genius move by Marvel just because of the fact that instead of forcing people to go out and buy a singular comic about a character that they weren't really interested in. Instead, they got to buy a comic that featured a whole bunch of characters. And so if they were interested in the Incredible Hulk, ride-ins and so on and so forth, that, that would really just kind of, you know, beef up the character a little bit more and it would give Marvel an indication of what it was that people were wildly interested in or what they thought to be pretty intriguing. And so the result was that over the course of his publication history, eventually the Tales to Astonish line was effectively dropped off in issue number 101 and it began the Incredible Hulk volume two with issue number 102. And the reason why this is so important is because of the fact that this actually uh, was really written by Lynn Wine between 1974 and 1978. And this coincides almost directly with the introduction of Wolverine. And in fact, we'll probably have a discussion about him at a later point in time, but the long and short of his character was that Lynn Wine, alongside Herb Trimp, who was drawing it at the time, were basically tasked with the idea of just creating a character named Wolverine, who was going to be this sort of, uh, not necessarily as strong and as powerful as the Incredible Hulk was, but every bit as savage. And so, of course, Wolverine proved to be relatively popular, was a eventually rolled over into giant size X-Men issue number one the following year, and then became part of the main X-Men roster under Chris Claremont. But again, this is really kind of how Marvel did things back in the 1960s, 1970s, and even going into the 80s and, and early 90s. It was the idea of just having this giant melting pot of characters crossing over, characters being introduced in other characters' books, and then ultimately hoping those characters would succeed, which some of them did and, and some of them didn't. But the fact remains here, with Lynn Wine being a, a pretty celebrated writer with regards to the Incredible Hulk and even, you know, getting his own television series later on, in issue number 245 in March of 1980, a guy by the name of Bill Mantlo came onto the scene. Now, Bill Mantlo at the time was really more of like a fledging writer when it came to Marvel Comics. He was basically just a guy that was a fill-in writer. And the reason for that was because of the fact that the editor-in-chief of Marvel at the time, and I want to say it was Lynn Wine, but I don't think it was, uh, but the editor-in-chief at the time basically had this idea that Marvel was running into issues of, you know, prints being delayed and things like that because they were all hand-drawn. Marvel wanted to make sure that there were always fill-in stories whenever, you know, a particular story was running late. And so if it was The Incredible Hulk and it was a six-issue limited series or a six-issue run and issue number six was running late, Marvel wanted to make sure that they had a fill-in story between five and six. And so what they did is they basically tasked Bill Mantlo with creating all these different fill-in stories. And he actually did a pretty good job with regards to the entire gamut of Marvel's superhero lineup. And the result was that with issue number 245, he was rolled over. Now, for Bill Mantlo, looking at The Incredible Hulk, one of the biggest issues that he saw was that going into the 80s and looking at the environment of comic books at the time, you got to remember, in 1971, Gwen Stacy died. And so it made comics a little more visceral and it introduced the notion that a superhero could fail. And so what it meant is that he could, he could in turn make the Incredible Hulk more human. He could make him a little more relatable, make him a little more tangible. And so the idea was to introduce the notion of Bruce Banner having been a product of child abuse. And so what, uh, what Bill Manlow did is he introduced the story of Bruce Banner's father being an extremely abusive man uh, in relation to both Bruce's mother as well as, uh, as Bruce himself. And a lot of this was rooted in the fact that Bruce was so smart as a child. And so because of this, the Incredible Hulk was basically twisted into this notion of kind of representing all this suppressed rage and all the suppressed anger that Bruce Banner had kept inside after, you know, dealing, going through all these ordeals with his father abusing him, you know, beating him up and different things like that. And so again, it turned out to be wildly popular with regards to the Incredible Hulk me uh, mythos just because of the fact that people love to see failings in the character. They love to know that the Incredible Hulk was just a guy who was really just sort of struggling, you know, for the most part. Now, of course, up to this point, over the course of Marvel's publication history, different people had been introduced. Tales to Astonish saw the introduction of the leader, you know, characters like Betty Ross, the love interests of Bruce Banner were, were introduced and different things along those lines. But the idea was that looking at the Incredible Hulk landscape and looking at all these different things that had taken place with Bill 
Mantlo uh, effectively ending his run. John Byrne and a handful of others taking over, leading to Peter David uh, taking over the story with issue number 331. The goal was to basically remove Betty Ross from the equation. And the reason why is because of the fact that for a lot of people, really a lot of the higher ups in Marvel, they looked at Betty Ross as the kind of Mary Jane Watson of uh, the Incredible Hulk mythos. And what I mean by that is in the Spider-Man comics, Mary Jane Watson put an age on Peter Parker. It takes him away from the relatable nature that made him so popular initially in the, in the sense that teenagers looked at him and saw a reflection of themselves. And so the result was that, of course, you know, as most people know in One More Day, Peter Parker, Spider-Man, basically the marriage to Mary Jane Watson was nullified. Uh, this whole thing with regards to, to Betty Ross back in 1998 was effectively the exact same maneuver, just by a different means. And so by removing Betty Ross from the equation, the goal was to take away the one thing that allowed the Incredible Hulk to be calm, that allowed the Incredible Hulk to relax, that could have potentially been the way by which a future writer could remove the entire Incredible Hulk landscape and either turn the character into something totally unrelatable or turn him into something better. The problem is that it was a coin flip and Marvel didn't want to take the risk. And so the result was that uh, where Betty Ross was essentially killed off, Marvel wanted to bring the whole idea of, you know, Savage Hulk back into the equation to make the Incredible Hulk just as cruel and brutal as he was before. Now, of course, during this whole era where Peter David had taken over the title, the overall gist was that he had written a litany of stories that helped to expand on the Incredible Hulk in a way that was never thought possible. Uh, a lot of these were really just kind of focused on the notion of the relationship between Bruce Banner and the Incredible Hulk himself. A lot of them really revisited the Bill Mantlo stories of the Incredible Hulk suffering different forms of, uh, of child abuse. But one of the most notable aspects is what the world would look like if the Incredible Hulk became a bad guy. And this actually came out of a two-part original graphic novel called Future Imperfect. Now, Future Imperfect introduced a villain by the name of Maestro Hulk, which was basically a version of the Incredible Hulk in a dystopian future who was irradiated with nuclear energy and was essentially just the last remaining superhero on Earth, or at least the last remaining superpowered being on Earth, and ultimately was ruling this city called Dystopia. But the Maestro Hulk, of course, where it saw the traditional Incredible Hulk, you know, more or less brought over through the time stream to fight Maestro, Maestro was faster, he was stronger, he was smarter, he was basically a cut above the Incredible Hulk as we knew him. And where it did introduce some pretty incredible stories, it also introduced the idea of the Incredible Hulk having a fear of what he would become later on down the line if he wasn't kept in check. At the same time, it also saw events like the Onslaught Saga, for example, you know, Marvel kind of looking around at their landscape and realizing that if it wasn't called X-Men and wasn't called Spider-Man, then it simply wasn't selling. Uh, they basically wanted to kind of do the soft reboot with the Avengers, Fantastic Four, and so on and so forth. And so they essentially had this onslaught entity, this you know amalgamation of Charles Xavier's mind and powers and Magneto's mind and powers kind of merging together, leading to onslaught, basically just running amok through the entirety of the planet Earth. Uh, the Bruce Banner personality was essentially suppressed by Jean Grey, which eventually led to you know this sort of return of the Savage Hulk simply by a different means. And the result was that it was popular for a time, but the overarching goal was to kind of you know return things to a measure of familiarity. The problem with this is that when Peter David left the Incredible Hulk title, all the work that he had done effectively went down the drain. And the reason why was because nobody was able to continue the various stories that he had pulled off to write things the way that he did. And so the result was that over the course of the next, you know, six or seven years going into 2004, 2005, 2006, the Incredible Hulk just kind of wandered around the Marvel landscape. He'd pop up in stories here and there and things would happen, but it was really much a return to 1960s, 1970s Hulk, where nothing of significance ever really happened in his stories. Now, this began to change when it came to the House of M with regards to Peter David kind of coming back on temporarily and writing a few of the Incredible Hulk stories, but ultimately bailed out just because of the fact that he didn't want to be the Incredible Hulk guy. And so what this did is it set the stage for the introduction of Greg Pak to take over the title. Now, Greg Pak largely looked at the writings of Peter David, looked at the writings of Bill Mantlo, and even John Byrne and a handful of others, and used all those for individual stories, you know, to, to craft on his own. And the result was that uh, Greg Pak immediately set about basically instigating a series of events whereby the Incredible Hulk would basically be the front runner and Bruce Banner would be the, be the background character. And the reason for this was because of the fact that for the most part, when it came to the Incredible Hulk stories, uh, historically speaking, even under Mantlo's run, even under Peter David's run, it was always about looking at the Incredible Hulk and Bruce Banner together, never really just one or the other. And so the result is that Greg Pak decided to instigate an event called Planet Hulk, which would see, you know, the Incredible Hulk basically removed from the planet Earth and then through incidental means, crash landing on a planet called Sakaar. And what this did is it basically thrust the Incredible Hulk into the front landscape with hide nor hair of Bruce Banner. He was effectively gone. It was strictly an Incredible Hulk story. And what this did is it set in motion this multi-year epic that dealt with the Incredible Hulk coming back to Earth after, you know, he had found love on Sakaar, only to have it taken away, really just kind of waging a war against the superhero community, just crushing everybody. It was a story that was designed to look at the very nature of the Incredible Hulk and say, what happens when the very dark nature of humanity 
humanity, this kind of savage aspect of what makes people who they are, really becomes sentient and then decides to turn its guns against humanity. And that's what the Incredible Hulk did. He absolutely just ripped everything apart. Now, again, we have all these videos down in the description, so you don't really have to worry about that too much. I mean, you're welcome to go and check all those out. So we're not going to go through every single iota of those. But the idea here was that in the middle of Greg Pak basically writing his whole run, we also saw the introduction of, uh, of Red Hulk. We also saw characters like Rick Jones becoming a bomb. You know, of course, we saw the return of characters like Abomination and different things like that. A lot of these individuals who had been villains or they were allies, whatever the case may be, being rolled over into the Incredible Hulk mythos in a wholesale revamp of the landscape. Again, the biggest issue with this is that once Greg Pak left, the Incredible Hulk just kind of found himself tumbling down the rabbit hole of uh, these small time stories that didn't last anything more than, you know, 10, 20 issues until they were canceled. And then just kind of, you know, being relaunched with a different name and a few more stories being told and then the whole thing being canceled and so on and so forth. And so really, you know, with guys like uh, Jason Aaron picking up the pen and working on Incredible Hulk stories proper, uh, not a whole lot was done with regards to expansion on the Incredible Hulk mythos. Instead, it was really more of just writing stories that were interesting, that were intriguing. What if Bruce Banner and the Incredible Hulk had two separate bodies, different things like that. And so ultimately, because of the fact that Greg Pak had introduced a character named Amadeus Cho, a Korean American who's one of the smartest people on the planet, who for the most part was really just kind of a supporting character throughout the entire run of Incredible Hulk, what he ended up doing with all new, all different Marvel was basically removing Bruce Banner from the equation and putting Amadeus Cho Hulk in his place. Now, this had received a lot of mixed reviews. And the reason was because a lot of people who had been reading The Incredible Hulk only ever read about Bruce Banner. He was really the only Hulk he ever got. It always consolidated back down to Bruce Banner himself. And so the result was that people looked at the entire set of events and said, ultimately, it's not the character that they're used to. It's not the character that they want. This was compounded by the fact that where fans hoped that Bruce Banner would return, and there were even some teases to the idea that Bruce Banner might come back, this all effectively went away when Bruce Banner was shot and killed by Hawkeye during the events of Civil War II. As divisive as that story was, it ultimately led to this idea that Bruce Banner was never going to come back. And so because of the fact that Marvel received so much backlash from regards, you know, to the death of Bruce Banner, to the idea that the Incredible Hulk as we knew him wouldn't return, this basically set in motion the whole Marvel Legacy event, or at least one of the things that set in motion the whole Marvel Legacy event, which eventually led to the Incredible Hulk kind of being rolled back in again, and the idea of Bruce Banner retaking his mantle, or at the very least, you know, re-emerging back as another version of the Incredible Hulk. But with that being said, guys, uh, I mean, we've covered enough Hulk stuff, and I think it's popular enough that when it comes to his powers, they're pretty straightforward. I mean, his, his strength is limitless. I mean, it's infinite, you know, so long as he's alive long enough to keep getting angrier, he'll keep getting stronger. Now, I mean, there are beings out there that can destroy the Incredible Hulk. The Incredible Hulk's ability is strength and durability. And it's really durability against some pretty powerful beings, of course, against conventional weapons, but somebody who can warp reality, cosmic entities, Galactus, different things like that. The Incredible Hulk can't, he really can't take those guys out. I mean, I can't really envision a scenario where the Incredible Hulk would be so strong that he would be able to take out Galactus. I've never really heard of anything like that happening. And even in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, which kind of pushed things to the extreme, the Incredible Hulk would really be no match for Loki. I mean, it's really just not one of those things that works. When it comes to pure strength, sure. When it's just a, you know, a fist-to-fist, -fist, brawl, knockdown, drag-out fight, yes, the Incredible Hulk will take the cake. But given all the, the knowledge that Loki has on sorcery and magic and so on and so forth, there's a million things he could do to, to take out the Incredible Hulk. I mean, it was a cool moment to see the Incredible Hulk just smashing him around like a ragdoll. <laughs> but at the end of the day, the Incredible Hulk's ability is strength. And so, of course, it's limitless, but it's confined to him just basically kind of having to punch people. You know, if he's facing a foe that he can't touch, then the Incredible Hulk is about as useless as anybody else. So with that being said, guys, we're going to go ahead and bring this video to an end. If you are new here to Comics Explained, make sure you guys hit the sub button to become part of the Rob Corps. If you guys enjoy this video, make sure you drop a like and leave a comment down below. Let me know what are the characters that are coming out as part of Marvel Legacy or characters that are in DC Rebirth that you want to see me do discussions on. And I will catch you all later. Peace.